When the time comes and I'm standing at the river that separates the two worlds that I love. Torn between my precious friends and family and the place of peace that's waiting up above. Hold my hand and stay with me a while. And when I finally step into that tide, celebrate me there, celebrate me there, celebrate me in that land of wonder where nothing can compare. Celebrate me in that place. Celebrate me saved by grace. Don't just sit and weep because I'm gone. Celebrate me home. I've spent most my years on earth preparing to take the trip from here to heaven's throne. And with the shield and word of God to guide me, with the comfort knowing I am not alone. So when I take my final feeding breath and fade into the gentle sleep of death. Celebrate me home. Celebrate me there. Celebrate me in that land of wonder where nothing can compare. Celebrate me in that place. Celebrate me saved by grace. Don't just sit and weep because I'm gone, celebrate me home. No more broken dreams and no more tears to cry into my Father's arms. I'll fly. where nothing can compare. Celebrate me in that place. Celebrate me saved by grace. Don't just sit and weep because I'm gone. Celebrate me Well, we are gathered here today in this place to honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and to remember a very special person, Miss Gloria Hurst. And I know that she was loved by many and she was always such a sweet individual to me and so kind. And I know these times like these are always difficult, but the scriptures say <clears throat> that it's good for us to be gathered here today. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, A good name <clears throat> is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of one's birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. The Scripture says it's better to go to a funeral than to go to a party. 
kind of cuts against our human thinking, doesn't it? But a person's death may be better than the day of their birth if they have a lasting reputation. We learn more about the meaning of life in a setting like this today. Today we learn about what life is really about, what really counts. We learn here more than we do at the house of feasting. But I'm so grateful that in times like these when our hearts are heavy and we're facing times of sorrow and grief that we have the word of God that we can go to that is not of man. It's the word of God. And God will speak a word to us. And I just want to read a couple of passages that I kind of had on my mind and preparing for our time together today. And I want to lead us in a word of prayer. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Psalm 10, verse 17. Lord, you know the hopes of the helpless. Surely you will hear their cries and comfort them. Psalm 38, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, he rescues those whose spirit are crushed. <clears throat> Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in time of trouble. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. May God bless his word, and may we hide his word in our hearts, and may those scriptures bring you comfort today. Can I pray with you today? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you alone are God, and there is none like you. God, you are the most high, and you're the most glorious. You are sovereign. You're infinitely wise. You're perfect in love. And Lord, the thoughts of you cheer our hearts. And God, as we're gathered here today, we're tasting the bitter providences that you allow to come into our lives. And Lord, I know there's sorrow today, and I know there's hurt and pain. And I know there are hearts that are restless, but Lord, you are forever at peace. Oh God, you never slumber nor sleep. Your right hand upholds and your everlasting arms are always there to undergird us and help us. And Lord, at a time when we're very aware of death, I thank you for your living presence. Oh God, great is your faithfulness and that faithfulness gives us comfort today and comfort tomorrow and the days ahead. Father, I pray today that you would help this family to look to the risen Christ. Lord, we're weak and we are sinful. And Lord, in our humanness we fail. And God, sin mars our vision of who you are. Sin makes us forget you. But God, I pray you would help us to trust you. Your mercy, O oh God, endures forever. You are holy, you are good, you are just, you are gracious. You're awesome in power and glorious. God, you are worthy to be trusted, worthy to be believed. God, we cry out, Lord, we believe, but God, help our unbelief. 
And Lord, I pray for all of this family today. May they feel your comforting presence. May they know your perfect peace. May they experience your sustaining strength. May they know, Lord, they are loved, and we bring them today to the throne of grace and pray that you would give them sufficient grace that we read about today to sustain them in the days ahead. God, I pray that this family would obey you in all things, that they would live for you and glorify you through their lives. And Lord, we thank you for Miss Gloria's life. We thank you for her, and we thank you for Jesus. He is so precious, and we look to you today. And God, when we look to the Lord Jesus, we see a nail-scarred hand, a beaten brow. We see one who loved us so much. I pray for Brother Ed today as he comes and shares from the Word of God. Lord, just enable him by your Spirit. God, today we're reminded of the brevity of life and how important it is for us to submit our lives to you and to live for your glory. Help us, Lord, to live each day for your glory and to deepen our commitment to you. I pray for anyone here today that's unprepared for the hour of death. God, I pray you'd speak to them through your word. May the Holy Spirit bring about great conviction to show them their need and to show them a wonderful Savior who stands ready to save. Lord, I pray this prayer in Jesus' sweet and wonderful name. And for his sake, amen and amen. I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken. For time
as we come together this morning, we come to seek to remember Gloria and also to find comfort for ourselves, and we look for comfort as a family. And as I thought about her, there's some things I want to share with you concerning Gloria and her life. You know so much about her suffering as, as I do in recent months. And I want to say to you that Gloria was a member of of our family, of my family, for almost 55 years. I thank God for that and for her, and I had the privilege when she and Ronnie were married of doing the ceremony for them, and now I stand here today to uh, help conduct her funeral, this memorial service. Gloria was for a long time a very active member of Mount Calvary Baptist Church. She taught Sunday school, children in Sunday school, and she also uh, sang in the choir, among many other things that she did as she served there in the church. She was a wonderful daughter-in-law to my mother. In fact, she did too much for my mother. Mama sat down after Daddy died uh, to die herself and lived from, uh, from 1966 until uh, 1987. Gloria waited on her and took care of her until the last five years of her life when she was at the nursing home at Baptist Village. She was an excellent daughter-in-law. Uh, she, her education, I will say a word about that. She uh, dropped out of high school when she and Ronnie got married and started a family. But I want to tell you that she got her GED later in life when she was challenged by one of the teachers that she was working with as a teacher's aide who showed her her check and compared the difference in her check and Gloria's check and said, if you go to school and get your degree, you can make what I'm making or more. With a family, raising a family, she went to school. She got her GED. She went to college. She finished college. Then she got her master's degree. And I was so proud of her and the fact that she did that. And then she taught all those years until she retired. Uh, and then when she retired, she took the best care of my brother, Ronnie, who was dying with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, that she could possibly take of him. Juanita and I have always loved Gloria, and we love you as a family today. After Ronnie died, some things happened in Gloria's life, and some things that she did caused some perhaps to doubt her salvation, maybe even some of the family to doubt whether or not she was saved. I want to share this scripture with you, and I share it as a background of what I want to say at this point concerning, uh, concerning Gloria's life and her relationship to Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, 10, and 11, it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor uh, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And then this precious verse, verse 11. The Bible says, Paul's writing inspired by the Holy Spirit, he said, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Now, because there's so much confusion concerning two of the terms that I read from this passage of scripture, I want to tell you what they mean. The word fornication means a sexual encounter or relationship outside the bonds of marriage. Adultery means a sexual relationship with someone who is married to another. Those two words stand out in this passage of scripture as I clarify these terms. Because you and I cannot base our salvation on an experience we had back yonder. We can't base it on a card we signed. We can't base it on the baptism that we experienced. We can't base it on some experience that we have encountered along the way. Our salvation is based on the life that I'm living now, here and now, as a result of the fact that Jesus Christ changed my life and made me into a different person and gave me a new nature. Uh, this is important. Uh, Gloria also had some doubts about her own salvation whether she was not saved or not. She had Ted call me one Sunday afternoon several weeks ago and ask me if I could come 
to the house and talked to, to her, to talk to them in essence. I sat down with the two of them and I shared the plan of salvation with Gloria, went over that plan of salvation, shared the gospel in essence with her. And as I finished sharing the gospel with her and asked her, Gloria, is this true in your life? Have you really made a commitment to Jesus Christ? Do you really know him as the Lord of your life and as your uh, Savior? Uh, she lit up and said to me, yes. She affirmed that she had accepted Christ, that she loved him and served him, but she had drifted far from him and from a life of righteousness. Because of her renewed commitment to him and her, the renewal of her uh, commitment to, to the Lord Jesus Christ and to our God, who is a forgiving God, as I read that verse of scripture a moment ago, she knew God's forgiveness. And I stand here today and tell you, I believe with all of my heart that Gloria is with Jesus today. She had mentioned that she wanted to be, go, go home and to be with Ronnie when she was suffering so badly before coronavirus moved in and other problems that she had that brought about her, her death eventually. Uh, since this is true for, uh, for the living and, uh, and also for the dead, I want to turn uh, to the scriptures and share with you two biblical truths that are undeniable. And in so doing, I will uh, share several passages of scripture with you this morning. And I want to take some time to do that. Number one, I want to tell you that our Lord loves you more than you can possibly understand. I stand here and tell you that Satan is the source of evil and of tragedy in our world today. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, the first part of that verse, and Jesus is speaking, he said the thief, talking about the devil, comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the work of Satan. And Satan, the Bible teaches, is the God of this age. Human beings bring some things on themselves by the way their, the, their lifestyle and uh, what they do to, to themselves and to others. Uh, Satan is behind even that. His purpose is to especially to destroy and to defeat those of us who are, are Christians. He is the God of this age, and he's active in our world today. Uh, the second thing concerning God's love for us is that God is the source of everything that is good. Everything you and I have ever experienced in our life that's good came from God. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadow praise God for his goodness to us uh, how many people when you think about it and you, he's blamed for a lot of stuff that he's not responsible for how many people did Jesus zap with some type of sickness or with uh, some tragedy while he was here on this earth? The answer is not one, not a single one. Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, from the Father of life, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. He is the perfect and, the perfect and flawless and holy goodness of God, results in his doing and giving us that which is good. God is good. And whatever God brings to us and gives to us is beneficial and good and perfect. Now, sometimes God will, uh, will discipline us as your children. If you don't believe that, you get out of line. And I, I'll use some human language here. God will bust your britches in discipline, disciplining you. Now, I want to come to what I said initially. God, is, God loves us more than we can possibly understand. God is the source of love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, you and me, that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Bible says, now Jesus loved his own. He loved them unto the very end, unto the uttermost. First John 1 John 1.10, the Bible says, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he gave his son to be the propitiation, that is the sacrifice on the cross for our sins. In Romans chapter, uh, chapter uh, 5 and verse 8, 
The Bible says but God's love is manifested toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died uh, for us. And then this verse that I love, in John eleven five, 5, Jesus is dealing with the matter of Lazarus, his family, and with his death. The Bible says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loved you and me, and you can put your name in that place and be sure that Jesus loved you just like he loved Lazarus and, and Martha and her sister. Then Paul, writing to the Galatians in Galatians 2.20, said, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The second thing that I want you to see in addition to the fact that our Lord loves you and me more than we can possibly understand is that our Lord makes, uh, makes uh, uh, has, has given us, our Lord has given us as Christians some unbelievable promises. And I want to share two or three of these with you. To, he, he promised to give us peace in the midst of, of uh, all kinds of circumstances in every circumstance. In John's Gospel, chapter, uh, chapter 14 and verse 27, Jesus is talking to the disciples as he's approaching Jerusalem and approaching the cross. And he said to them uh, very clearly, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. He imparted, imparts to us the very peace of God, the peace that God knows, the peace that Jesus himself knew. He gives us that peace that, that is beyond human comprehension. The Bible says in Philippians, in the book of Philippians chapter 4, that talks about the, the poise and calm and wholeness and inner internal harmony. The absence of, uh, of, of a of uh, difficulty and fear in the very face of conflict and in the face of difficulty. So he, uh, he offers us uh, this peace and provides this peace for us. And I've seen people facing some very, very difficult situations lying before them. I've seen my wife about to go into surgery, not knowing whether she would come out alive or not, uh, have a perfect peace. You don't do that on your own. God has to give you his peace, the kind of peace that Jesus knew. The second thing that I want you to know is that he uh, promised to comfort uh, us as Christians, those of us who trust in him. In John chapter 14, as Jesus again was trying to prepare the disciples for his departure uh, from them in verses uh, 16 and following, Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, listen to this, because he abides with you and will be with you forever. Will be with you forever. Jesus said, I will, come, I will not leave you orphans or comfortless, but I will come unto you. And he did come as the Holy Spirit. He also said in John 14, Verses 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Thirdly, God promises to cause all things to work together for good to those who are his children, to those who know him. Romans 8.28 says, uh, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. Uh, the bad things as well as the good, God is able in his sovereignty to cause them to work together for my good and your good and for his honor and his glory. Those who love him is those who that love him in response to his love for us. Those who are the called are the ones who heard the call to salvation and responded to that call by submitting to the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ and receiving him as their, as their Savior. The final thing that I want to share with you is he promised to save lost people from his wrath. He promised to save lost people from his wrath. Aren't you glad if you're saved? Aren't you glad he promised to save you from his wrath? 
the most important thing in life, if Gloria could stand where I'm standing today and speak to you, I believe she'd say the most important thing in life is not our recreation, it's not, uh, it's not golfing, it's not, uh, it's not the stock market, it's not uh, our uh, education, it's not our work, it's not partying, it's not having fun, it's not even, uh, it's not even family. But the absolutely most important thing in life is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, everything else ceases at the moment of our death. But our relationship with Jesus Christ is for now and for all eternity. And that's the important thing, the most important thing of all. Now, salvation is not based on what you do or don't do. And you need to get this right. I want to say it again. Salvation is not based on what you do or don't do. Salvation is based on what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross for your sins and my sins. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, in order, uh, you and I cannot do enough good. We cannot be good enough to deserve uh, God's, God's salvation, but we can receive it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, we are saved by his grace and brought into the family of God into a right relationship with him. In order for us to be saved, we must come to recognize that we personally are a sinner. A sinner of the worst kind, the worst degree. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That word all means each one of us individually leaving out no one, but each of us individually has sinned and come short of the glory of God. In order to be saved, we must understand that the wages of sin is death in the sense of separation from God, Romans 6, 23, the first part of that verse. Ezekiel 18, verse 20 says that, that the one who sins shall die. That the one who sins will die. Uh, that we, we must understand also that... Uh, Instead of separation from God, spiritual death, that uh, the offer of God is eternal life. He said, but the gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We must understand also that God must draw us to himself, convicting us of our sins and bringing us into that relationship with himself. In, in John chapter 6, verse 37 uh, Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no wise certainly not cast him out. In verse 44, uh, he, sa he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. I will raise him up in the last day. We must understand that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is Savior. He's the only one who can save you. Nobody, Mohammed or, or uh, Allah or no one else, Buddha, no one else can save you. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save you from sin and from your lostness and from the lake of fire, which is the second death, the Bible says. The Bible says concerning this matter, Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. Uh, Peter said in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And then we must understand that we are saved by turning from our sins, which is called repentance and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, submitting to him as our Lord as I think about uh, this, I think about Acts 2.38 and this precious passage of Scripture. Peter had preached a message on the day of Pentecost and it was almost like he'd pointed his finger, his bony finger in the face of that multitude of people, those who had crucified Jesus and told them that they had killed their Messiah that they'd been looking for for centuries. And they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And he answered them in Acts chapter. 2 verse 38 but Peter said to them repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ literally 
because of the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, there were some goody-goody two-shoes in Jesus' day, and they, the Tower of Siloam had fallen on some people and killed them, and they thought they must be the worst sinners in all of the world. And they shared this with Jesus, and Jesus said, I tell you, no, but except you repent, talking to religious people, except you repent, you will likewise perish. And then they told, he told them about uh, some people who were offering their sacrifice, and Pilate uh, killed them, slaughtered them, and mingled their blood with the blood of their sacrifice that they were offering to God. And they thought they were terrible, and that's why uh, this had befallen them. But he said, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will likewise uh, perish. You will perish also. In Romans, uh, or in uh, the, the, the next thing that I need to say to you, in addition to that, is that we need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That means to believe that he's who he said he was and that he did what the Bible says he did and submit our life to him as Lord, as the Lord and Master of our life. The Bible says this says this uh, said that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you shall be saved you shall be saved to be saved we must receive Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross and at the empty tomb 1 John chapter 5 verses 11 and 12 says this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has received the Son. Who, he who has the Son has the life. But he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Now, as I think about this, and you think of these precious promises that he has offered to us and made to us today, and how wonderful and how great they are. You can have all of this if you're lost today. You need Jesus. You need a Savior. And you need him now. You desperately need him more than you ever needed anything else or will ever need anything else in all of your life. And I'm glad the Bible says whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that is understanding you're a sinner and understanding the penalty for your sins and understanding that repentance and faith are necessary in order for you to come to Jesus. And when you, do, when you understand that and cry out to him, he promised to save you. Know that he loves you more than you can imagine. He wants to save you more than anything else in all of life. You cannot, we, you, we cannot bring Gloria back today, but I want to tell you that you and I can go to be where she is to be with her by receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I want to turn to the Old Testament for the final scripture and share with you, this is found in, in, in Samuel, in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. She conceived and bore a child. And God said, I'm going to take the life of this child. I'm going to take this child away from you as a punishment for your sin. The child was stricken, critically ill. David uh, went into the temple and threw himself on the floor and lay there for seven days without eating or drinking, praying. He said he thought perhaps God might spare the child's life. His servants tried to minister to him, and he refused to eat or drink or to even get up off the floor. The baby died. And the servants were whispering among themselves and saying he took the, the sickness, the threat of death so hard, we don't think we can tell him that the baby's died. We don't know how he'll react if we tell him the baby's died. He perceived that they, the baby had died as he saw them talking to one another among themselves. And when he saw that, he asked, is, is the child dead? And they said, yes. David did a very unusual thing. He got up off the floor. He, uh, changed, he bathed and changed his clothes. And uh, he worshiped the Lord. And he went down to his house, and they set food before him, and he ate and nourished his weakened body. But I want you to notice what he said in these verses then his servants said to him what is this thing that you have done talking about his reaction to the child's death and he said while the child was alive they said while the child was alive you fasted and wept but when the child died 
you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. Listen to this, but now he has died. Why should I fast? Why should I fast? Then he asked the question, can I bring him back again? And the answer to that question is no. The way that question is framed, it's, the only required answer is no. And this is what he said. He said, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. I stand here this morning and tell you by God's grace, through the salvation provided by the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I and nothing else can bring Gloria back. But I stand here and tell you, you can go to be with her where she is. May God bless you. Pray with me as we close this part of the service. Father, as we come today into your presence, we come needy creatures. We come with grief in our hearts because of our loss. And that's a deep emotion. And I feel with this family and I share their loss and I share their grief because I grieve over the loss of my dear, precious sister-in-law. But Father, I thank you that we also rejoice today. In spite of our loss, we rejoice for her gain because she no longer suffers. She is no longer confined to a body that was almost destroyed by pain, by disease. God, I thank you that the ambulance won't ever have to roll up in front of the house again and load her up and take her to the hospital to do dialysis. I thank you that 911 will never have to be called to attend to her again. And I praise you for that. And we celebrate her homegoing and rejoice in that and grieve, but not as those who have no hope. Bless this family and all these friends that are gathered here this morning and meet every need we have of every heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.